Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. Come together for God's word. Shall we turn our Bibles to the book of Proverbs? There's been special love for the book of Proverbs for me these days. Uh, we'll turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 15. 19, we will read the verses responsibly, book of Proverbs, chapter 16 to 19. Let me read verse 16. Please read the alternate verses. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and hearts that divide the wicked imagination. That they trip in running a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. We'll uh, read uh, one more verse in uh, the book, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. Verse 20 to 23. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. For from within, or oh, verse 20, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for enabling us to come together around thy precious word and uh, especially to continue to understand the, the doctrine of man in his sin and the depravity. Father Lord, uh, we need you, Lord, to speak to us, to help us to understand the darkness of our sin and the heinousness of it and thereby, Lord, that we would cling on to the cross and run, Lord, to the covering in thy precious blood. Father, that we be not those that would uh, be deceived of the deceitfulness of sin, but that in your mercy and grace we would be preserved by the power and kept by thy power and preserved and Lord, uh, that we are not only, Lord, uh, preserved in Christ Jesus, but also are preserved by thy promises. 
Lord, uh, to walk worthy of thy high calling. This evening, as we consider thy word, I pray that you would speak through me, to me, to each one of us, and uh, in our study together, Father, that uh, you would uh, help us receive from the scriptures the depth of depravity so that we may consider the height of your love for our lives, Father, that uh, we may walk worthy of it. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, we began to look at uh, the doctrine of man and his sin. In, uh, in particular, we began to be introduced about the various words that the Bible uses for sin and also how they all can be summed called depravity. And uh, we understood from the rich study through the church history of how man's depravity is, can be misunderstood very easily and uh, can lead to uh, a wrong view of the gospel or even a shallow understanding of the gospel. Thereby, our Christian lives are, are greatly affected by not having the right understanding of sin and thereby the, the blessed gospel that Jesus and his work on the cross and his life brings to us. So um, as I went back home, uh, I felt that I have crammed too much as though like you eat a big bite and you figure out that you are trying to take too big then you can swallow. And I felt so and I realized there are there are, um, there's not only a sense of us trying to understand what is sin, which is what we have considered as a question, it is essential as a Christian to understand the abominableness of sin, the, the depth of depravity before we can appreciate the height of grace that uh, comes to a Christian in the power of the gospel. And so for the right foundation of Christian to be established on the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would not understand its uh, power, the gospel power, unless we know how deep we have sunk into the sin and its darkness. And so I've uh, prayerfully considered to extend this topic uh, as, a, as an individual, as a young teenager, when I came to, the, to be exposed to the scripture and the preaching of the uh, of what the bible has to say early in my, uh, in my coming to i wondered why the why the preachers so often preached about sin and had not how they continually pounded on this word called sin again and again and uh, it's only to help us see how deep our uh, our need for the Savior would be that we would only come to a realization of it when we are brought to a right understanding of how heinous sin is or how abominable sin is. So we've looked at a portion here as we turn to Proverbs chapter 6 uh, about seven abominable things and six things that the Lord hate. Notice the word abominable or hate. A God is a God of love. And when we think about love, it never comes to uh, make us think that there can be anything called hate be coming close to somebody who says he is love. Right? We would uh, have our children use these words left and right. I hate this or I hate pizza or I, or I don't know. They don't hate pizza though. They hate Indian food or whatever. <laughs> uh, but they don't know what they are saying sometimes. It's just that they don't like the taste of it a little, but uh, keep them starved for six or seven days. They would know <laughs> whether they hate anything called food, which God has blessed us so richly. Well, even then they might be okay for a few days, but uh, what we come to see is there's something that the Lord hates to the core. He abhors. He cannot stand it. And uh, that is his inherent nature. And uh, so we ought to come to this question 
as to what makes sin abominable, so hateful, so unstandable in his presence. And when you and I understand that, you and I are close to understanding the heart of God in how he loves holiness and his inherent nature of holiness is so lovable than what we might have as a, as a lenience to this thing called sin. So, uh, we've read this portion called Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, 16 to 19, about six and seven things. Hate and abominable is, they're the two words that stand out. But uh, before I come there, I want to just briefly bring us to where we are in what we looked last week, just so that we can quickly recap and move forward with what we have to consider today. First, we saw what is sin and its definition. Sin is nothing but the transgression of the law. Transgression meaning overstepping, crossing the line. We also saw other words that are used for sin, which is uh, in Greek, hamartia, which is missing the mark. We also saw iniquity, a bentness to do our own thing, Isaiah 53 verse 6. Or wickedness and evil, as Genesis 6, 5 brings to us. How, how inherently our hearts are tuned in the fall that man has received, uh, a nature to love wrongness and badness as opposed to how we, and we were originally made. In, as Adam was made, we will look at some words that are used by Augustine to help us understand that a little later. But to sum up all that words that the Bible uses sin can be brought down to one word called depravity, as we looked at. And in depravity, we saw its universality, meaning how it is spread across, that everyone is affected, that all have sinned. In Proverbs 20, verse 9, nobody can say, I have a clean heart. And uh, so we saw its universality, its intensity. We saw its intensity by considering two views in particular. One is the Pelagian view, who was in the time of Augustine, and uh, he brought out his view about man that he is not as corrupt as others might put it, uh, but that he is, he is inherently good and he just has a problem. Man's will is not affected according to him. And so he has this ability and will, if he chooses to, to choose God and to seek God and to find him. And so that was Pelagius' view as opposed to the Augustinian view. We, those are the two views that we saw. I just put in uh, the other view that is also there in those same lines. There's a view called the federal view, which is based on Adam being a representative of humanity, and that he broke, he had been in a covenant, and because he broke the covenant, he is going to bring all the humanity to be brought under the effects of the fall. And so that is a federal view which is not to be uh, bothered about so much, but the two more prominent views are the Pelagian view and then the Augustinian view that we were in Adam. Uh, that in Adam we all sinned. It's not that Adam just sinned, but given a choice, you and I have the same propensity to choose and rebel against God as Adam is. And so in Adam, we all have come under this effects of sin in that corrupt nature and the guilt as well. So we saw all that and then we moved on to the three prominent uh, understandings about depravity. One, as uh, Pelagius puts it, not depraved. There is no inheritance of sin or guilt, no, no death passed. Uh, because everyone's sin is responsible by the same person. And so man just needs help. And that's the prosperity gospel that we saw. And then we moved on to the partially depraved view, where in the semi-Pelagius view, as the Armenian view stands, we see that man receives corrupt nature, but not the guilt. And in this, we saw how there is some problems with this view. It's partially scriptural, gives a, a shallow understanding of the scripture. Man receives corrupt nature, and sin is a disease and a sickness rather than uh, a depravity of totality. So we saw these three things. Let me conclude by reminding us that we finally concluded to understand what total depravity is. As Augustine puts it, 
There is no ability for us to seek God or be righteous apart from God's grace. That is the total depravity view where we need the grace of God to be brought forth into the righteousness of God. Apart from that, we have no ability that we can choose God and seek and find God ourselves. We'll look at that a little more clearly today because I just introduced this. I just don't want it to be like, okay, because I said this, because Augustine said this, everybody, great men like Luther, Calvin believes we have to believe. That's not what we need to run after, but we can see for ourselves uh, of the various scriptural understandings that helps us to see and also get a clarity of what depravity is. Depravity can be misunderstood that man cannot do any good and that's not what depravity stands for. So let me help us to move forward today. What depravity doesn't mean. This is also scriptural and that's why as Augustine and all the Christian, I mean all the church historians like Luther, Calvin, they brought out to us of what depravity doesn't mean. Depravity doesn't mean everyone is as sinful as he can be. Meaning, if, uh, if we were to test everybody, there is a level of sinfulness that you and I can, can still further go down to. But on a given day, you are not as sinful as you, you can be always. And that can be understood from Genesis 15, 16, where God was speaking to Abraham and he says, after 400 years, I am going to bring your generation back and at that time they will inherit the promised land because the land is now uh, being uh, as a dwelling place for the Amorites and their sin is not ripe enough. And when their sin ripe is, is going to be ripe enough, I will judge. In that he knew their heart and their, their propensity to continue rather than coming to the truth of the true and the living God, their propensity to continue in the generations to come as well of how their sin is going to be ripe. And at that time, he's going to judge. And so Amorites at that time of Abraham, they were not as sinful as they ought to be. And so there is an increased intensity of sin that you and I can, or humanity, or every human being can grow into. Born out of, uh, out of, out of uh, the womb, man is not as sinful as he can be. You and I look at our children, we kind of see their ignorance, we kind of see how they grow slowly and steadily in their stubbornness, in their disobedience, in various ways, that we don't have to see them that they're heinously sinful right there at their birth. That's not what depravity is. Also, depravity is that a sinner, uh, depravity doesn't mean that a sinner has no knowledge of God. Romans 1, 18 to 21, we note that in depravity, in our unrighteousness, we suppress the truth. We might know and hear about God. We might even consider that there is a God who made all humanity, but we don't want to worship Him because should we choose to, we have to deal with our sin. Should we choose to, we have to come to acknowledge our sinfulness and be brought into humility. In our pride, we don't want to do that. And so, a sinner, although he has knowledge of God, he would suppress the truth in his unrighteousness or in her unrighteousness. And so, depravity doesn't mean man doesn't have any knowledge of God. That's not what depravity means, okay? And moving quickly, the sinner has no ability to distinguish between good and evil. Romans 2 verse 14 gives to us that God had made man with, a, with an inherent uh, ability with conscience. And this conscience, we look to our children as they do what they were asked to do and the moment they turn their eyes away from when we ask a question, do you do what I'm asking you to do? By that we know whether they did what they were supposed to do or whether they did something mischievous. Because they have it in their inherent heart, they, a thing called conscience that gives to them uh, a way to discern that they did what, they, what is good or what is bad. It has 
this guilt or not guilty, at least to begin with. And slowly, that conscience is going to come to a point of ignoring all that red flags that are raised, so much so that it can be dead or it can be seared, which is not what we would want to go down to. But so, God has given a man, has been made in his own image, a discernibility to discern between good and evil. And that still remains. Depravity doesn't take that away. Man does have that. A sinner can do nothing good. This is another understanding we might get into unnecessarily. Oh, when we look at our friends, they do good, right? Sometimes they do good, even to the extent of helping out, that sometimes a Christian also might not help. This might be surprising to us. Such love that they show, such helpful nature that they have. And we wonder, where is depravity here? But the truth is, they, they actually can do a lot of good. They can do natural good, civil good, external religious good, all these kinds of goods they can do. And you know what? Even their good deeds, as we would look at, as what depravity means, depravity means man's slavery to sin. Man is somehow enslaved to sin and in his or her heart of hearts, there is this bound bondage of his will and of, of his own uh, tendency to time and again get into that habitual sinful patterns. Not that it has to be every time, every moment, every day, but time and again, opportunity is taken to show their allegiance to sin and thereby their dominance of their hearts and lives to the master called sin is there. And we see that, just read this verse with me. John, Job chapter 15 verse 16 gives to us a small picture of what depravity is. Job chapter 15 verse 16. And uh, you and I would just get a taste of what depravity is. Job chapter six, 15 verse 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? Should he choose or should uh, man in his sin has such tendency and propensity to get back to this addiction to serve the master called sin? And so that slavery to sin is there. Not only that, there is a struggle to sin so much so that even after becoming a Christian, as Paul puts it, oh, what a wretched man that I am. As Paul talks about it, because of this fallen self and sinful flesh that you and I are in, that depravity affects even after to an extent, to an extent that we struggle with sin. And so much so that we need the power of God to mortify uh, the deeds of our flesh with the power of the Spirit. And so we come to see depravity does mean our slavery to sin, our struggle to sin, and man's slavery, man's struggle, and then comes man's self-righteousness. Uh, in that, all the good that our fellow non-Christian friends and uh, brothers and sisters would do is so much so that it has a, this taint of wanting to exhibit their own self-righteousness. If you ask them why they do what they do, they say outwardly that it is a good thing to do, but with that there is an expectation that God would approve their life because of what they did, so that they don't have to humble themselves and say that they are the heinous sinners that God needs to save them utterly, right? And so this self-righteousness that is there, and so Paul talks about it in Romans 10 verse 1. He says, oh, that my own people, as zealous as they are, that they would come to know God. Outside of the self-righteousness, they would come to know the righteousness of Christ. And so the depravity means that man's propensity to self-righteousness, and it doesn't come close to being approved of God. And so that's depravity. And moving, we know that. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, but we all, we are all as an unclean thing and all our unrighteousness are as filthy rags, right? Even our good deeds, they have a taint 
of sin, a motive to want our own self-righteousness to be exhibited rather than God's righteousness. Now that said, moving quickly, man is set and unable to change his basic preference to sin unless he yields to God. And he doesn't want to yield to God because he loves that basic preference, a choice to choose to serve the master called sin. And that's depravity. And so all this to say that uh, actually uh, Augustine puts it this way, pre-fall, that is as Adam and Eve lived 100 years or so uh, without sin, without knowledge of sin even, that they loved and enjoyed the fellowship of God, they were created able not to sin. And that's why for 100 years, they were able to choose not to sin and they were able to live like that. And so they were made as pre-fall human beings that are created able not to sin. And then in fall, what man had come to is, he is not able not to sin. Very small, subtle changes there. He wants to sometimes impress God with his self-righteous deeds, but even with a taint and a stain of his own self-righteousness coming out. And so he's not able not to sin. And in fall, he's bound slave dominated by the master called sin. And then in perfection, once we are with Christ in glory, he will once for all be not able to sin. And that's why the Bible says, there'll be no more sin, no more pain. The last enemy called death is also destroyed. And so uh, in perfection, that is when we are in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will have his very nature perfected in us. Of course, Augustinian view of total depravity has some wrong notes on infants and baptism. Infants go to a limbo. Uh, they go to a, a place neither heaven nor hell. That's, that's a, a false view. We don't have to go far. And then it, baptism takes out our original sin. That's a wrong view. We don't have to take everything about that. But some things that were said well and right according to the scripture, is what we are coming to understand. And so Augustinian uh, statements bring to us to understand the total depravity in its right understanding. Moving forward, I also touched these little, I'll just list them and move forward quickly. Uh, we looked at the types of sin, sin by imputation. That is, in Adam, we all have sinned. And so there is an imputation of that sin. Romans 5, 12, 13 talks about how we inherit death and we were in Adam and we sinned. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, they both help us to understand the sin by imputation. And also last week we looked at Hebrews as well. Hebrews 7 verse 9 of how Levi was in Abraham as he gave the tithes. So those are some understanding that will help us to understand sin by imputation. Moving forward, just to list quickly, sin by commission. Um, all have sinned. Not only we have an account of sin in the fall through Adam, but also we commit sin. We love sin. And that's why we are sinners as well. And uh, one exception, both places is Jesus Christ. He knew no sin. He did no sin. And then moving forward, sin by omission. We don't give glory to God. We don't know who our owner is as the ox knows who its owner is. And we don't worship God, but we worship creation rather than creator. We saw sin by omission. We omit to give glory to God. This is, this is, in, this is absolutely to, to true in every, every human being who has not been redeemed in Christ. At least this part is true. And that itself is enough for them to, or every human being to understand the total depravity is a reality. Right? Moving forward quickly, sin by ignorance. Acts 13, 7, we saw Peter talks about you did give the king of glory to cross of Calvary in your ignorance. I know that. And he tells sin by ignorance. Sin unto death and sin not unto death. I rushed this quickly, but uh, I might have to correct myself on this statement here. Last week that I made, I was hinting to say sin unto death, this death being eternal death. But this death, actually, if you study a little more, is a physical death. Uh, 
a natural physical death. And that happens primarily in an unexamined life. Or in Genesis 9-6 it says, bloodshed would require bloodshed or capital punishment. When a Christian lives an unexamined life, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, verse 30, an unexamined participation in the Lord's table is going to cause people to have sickness and also sleeping in the Lord. That's a nice way of putting to say you're going to die. Don't say you're going to have sleep, nice sleep and come back. Sleeping in the Lord is in another way. Because they are Christians, they are saved by the grace of God, not by their own merit. They still are saved, but there is, there is a, a physical death that can come. And even if we pray that they, they would not die, that prayer is not going to be heard. So the, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, we hear this statement, Do not, I don't ask you to pray for those that, that are coming under sin unto death. I ask you to pray for those that are in sin not unto death. Meaning, those that know what is good, but they don't do it. So, the, so the, the understanding we need to take in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 is this physical death. That is, though we physically die, we still will be in Christ. Meaning, when they are on their deathbed as, as a Christian... God is going to help them to see their unexamined life and bring them to reconciliation. But, but the consequences of unexamined life of death is not going to be prevented. And that's what we come to seeing John exhorting that there is a sin unto death, sin not unto death, that we ought to be careful. And that death is the physical death there, not eternal death. I stand corrected there. Now, moving quickly, we move on to the sin unpardonable. I don't want to dwell. It is sin against Holy Ghost. All the gospel, many gospel writers explain to us as they blaspheme, blaspheme the Holy Ghost in denying the work of the Holy Ghost, convicting the Pharisees of their sin. Moving quickly, we, all, we saw all those types of sin, but I want to touch on the nature of sin. This is wonderfully important to understand how sin comes in many colors. Sin is not having the same color. Sin, as the Bible says, Satan also comes in the form of a, an angel of light, right? Sin comes in multi-color, so much so that it deceives us. And so we see its multiple colors as we take a look, a brief look at the nature of sin. And that is the first one small uh, color, the way that is often seen by everybody is sensuality, right? We all know how even the world recognizes, uh, especially most of the ascetism or Gnosticism, do not touch this, do not uh, eat this, do not do this. It all is prevalent even outside of Christianity, but even in Christianity, sensuality, which is letting our senses be satisfied with whatever is there in this world and yielding to that sensual desire as uh, in Ephesians 5.19 talking about Gentiles they just give up to their own sensual desires and in Galatians 5.19 we all know the desires of the, the, the deeds of the flesh the works of the flesh are listed there uh, and uh, I don't want to go through all that list but that said it, there is a a sensuality color to sin and, uh, and we give in. And the way to deal with it as a Christian is we come to have mortifying of, of the sin in the power of the Spirit of God. We know this Romans 8.13. It says that unless we put to death the deeds of the flesh, you and I, Unless we let the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit work in us to deliver us from the deeds of the flesh, you and I cannot overcome them by our own strength. And so here we come to see Romans 8.13. It says, For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
And then Galatians 5, 16 to 18 gives to us the warfare between the spirit and the flesh. And as a Christian, you and I have all the resources and equipment to overcome the deeds of the flesh. It is at our disposal. And as we yield to the work of the spirit, as we let the spirit be strengthened so that we can mortify the deeds of the body and flesh, you and I see the victory. And so we see the color of sensuality. We also see the color of selfishness. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 talks about how love does not please ourselves. Even 2 Timothy 3, 2 talks about lovers of self that come in the last days. Oh, how subtly we can become lovers of self. And so we ought to be careful with this color called selfishness, the color of sin called selfishness. And then there is another color called color that says about having a different nature than God, meaning Isaiah was there in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 4, we read, as Isaiah sees God and the vision of God as how the angels are worshipping God, he is terrified because of the distinct nature of God. The word holy is a word which means set apart or different, not like us, not like us. And, and so when he sees the unparalleled holiness as opposed to his own sinfulness, he sees how horrible, how horrific his sin is, so much so the color of differentness that we have as opposed to God's holiness is, a, is another thing that we need to be aware of. And uh, unlike God's nature, there is this sin nature um, as we see through the scriptures, a differentness that is there in God than us. A different place that is given to God. This is another color that sin comes in. Sin might not always come in sensuality. Sin comes and says, just place God just second. It's okay. For some time you can place him in the second place. Maybe your work is so important on a given day, or our spouses, or our kids, or whoever it is, let them get that priority. And soon enough, we give in to idolatry. And if not checked, there is an apostasy where there is a bentness to wanting their priorities as opposed to what God's priorities are. I don't have time to go through all that, but a color called placing God in a different place. Quickly, sin comes in the, in the color of unfaithfulness. We see that through and through. God is a God who, keep, who makes and keeps covenant. And man is a man who makes and breaks covenant, right? <laughs> he doesn't make covenant, but he gets into covenant and he loves breaking it. Time and again, we see how men of God have failed to keep their part. Even Israel as a nation failed. But God comes through again and again. And uh, even in this new covenant in Christ that you and I have come to, we are called to examine ourselves. If we are faithful, if we are faithful for the name that is there upon our lives, who didn't count it to be shame to have his name upon our lives. And so unfaithfulness is another color of sin. Quickly, unbelief. Hebrews 3.12 talks about how unbelief comes to us as we would look at it in another slide, in a very important way, we need to come to see how as those who have been blessed with faith, we take so long a time to trust God with more. We don't want to. We're not there. But God slowly, with long suffering, leads us to show his own trustworthiness. And so we see the color of unbelief. And see, so in many other ways, uh, it comes in the color of wickedness. And when I say wickedness, sometimes we think about all those bank robbers or adulterers who are in the prison. Don't think about that. Wickedness begins with haughtiness. The first sin that came into this creation is sin of pride. Pro Proverbs 16, 18 talks about pride goeth before destruction. As we'll, we'll look at it in a little more. And then comes to... Um, the other sin, this is also called the mother sin. I don't know. 
whether they are father's sin or anything, but mother's sin means a sin that has siblings or, or children down the line, meaning it not only has some effects there, but it causes other sins, it seems. So some categorize this sin called laziness into the mother sin category. Meaning laziness seems not that wrong, not that sinful, right? What's wrong? I've just slept a little more, right? Only to read from Proverbs, it says, O sluggard, go to the ants and learn from it. And uh, of course, in this cold weather, there are some excuses I, I, I give to that. <laughs> Don't always give the cold weather the blame, okay? <laughs> but the point here is, the problem with sluggard is, he thinks he's the wisest person. Go with me to Proverbs 26, verse 16. He says, he is wise in his own consent. And wow, when we examine before that Proverbs chapter 6, 26, a little verses above, that this fool who thinks he is wise in his own consent, he has such effects of sin all over his life and is being destroyed. The problem of laziness, if it were only that we would lose and be got, getting into poverty, that that's would have been a, a daughter sin. But it is mother sin because it is actually bringing out other sins. It leads us to our folly to be wise in our own consent and think that we are wise when we are not. And live a, a life of not God-fearing lives, which is what those who are wise in a godly sense would be, but live a man-fearing life trying to please men. And so, so many things that come out of this little sin that we think called laziness, which is a mother sin. Now, moving forward quickly, we come to see how sin comes into this world. We saw this, I just would review that. Uh, did I talk about it? Okay, no. I didn't talk about this, but I want to talk about just switching little gears here. What we are trying to understand is the origin of sin and a very important question to consider. And many times it comes to us in different formats, but this is the simple way that you and I can take this question. God is all powerful. He created everything, yet he is not the author of sin. How can it be? I don't know if you've had somebody ask this question. It is God's world that we live in. How did sin come into God's world? When he made everything, when he is all powerful, how could he not prevent sin not coming in? Or rather, was he weak not being able to prevent it? Or is he the author of sin? That's a question that our children would ask or sometimes skeptics would ask. And how can it be? And one thing that we find in the scriptures is a word called mystery. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There is a mystery to how iniquity and sin is at work. By the way, this doesn't mean that there is a mystery to the origin of sin. What I'm saying is, this is actually about talking about the, anti, the spirit of Antichrist that is at work. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 7, we also see this in 1 John chapter 4 verse 3. It says, the mystery that is at work here is the work of Antichrist. And John says there that he's already at work. Right from the early church, he's already at work. What is he working? Making people believe a false gospel that Jesus didn't come in his flesh. A Gnostic gospel. That everything fleshy or Everything in flesh is sinful. And so Jesus can't be in flesh. That's a false gospel. Jesus did come in flesh. He is a perfect substitute for your sin and mine. And he did bodily die and bodily rise. That is the true gospel. And so the mystery is there is a false gospel work that the Antichrist, the enemy is sowing, working disguisingly. And that's why it's called mystery. Now, that said, what is the origin of sin? When we go back to the first sin of all known beings, we see that it is the sin of Lucifer. We all know from Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14, it says, 
How art thou fallen o, from, from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? What was the son? What was the sin? The sin of pride. Verse 14 talks about how he wants to exalt himself even beyond the throne of God to see that he receives worship and glory because of all the glory that God gave him. Ezekiel 28 verse 15 talks about the, the king of Tyre as a picture image of the fallen angel called Lucifer of how he was in the garden of Eden or in the sense the, the first garden to, to lead people to worship God. And in the glory that God has given, sin entered into him and fall. Now we don't understand fully of why Lucifer gave into pride. We don't have all that detail in the scripture. But we know pride is one of the first sin. But we know some things about how sin entered human beings. The first sin of human beings is not pride. Of course, it has a tinge of pride, but tinge of pride, but it also it primarily is disobedience, right? We all would agree this sin of Eve and Adam. I put it in the right order, not Adam and Eve. <laughs> it is disobedience. And what disobedience, if you take note, and at its root, it began with this. If you and I observe carefully, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 onwards, as the conversation begins between Eve and serpent, it goes about to begin this way. There were these seeds of doubt that were being sown. And the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? There's a beginning of sowing the seeds of doubt. And if you observe, as Satan sowed the seeds of doubt in the heart of Eve about God withholding something that is good, we find very interestingly a pattern that goes even till date. The way, God, the way man yields to sin is that the moment he or she gives room to doubting the goodness of God, Doubting the, re the trueness of God's word. That is when we are stepping into a, an area that can lead to our fall. And the reason is we are contradicting a core definition of who God is. Every human being would agree that God is all powerful. God is mighty. God is holy. God is good. God is righteous. There is no sin in him. Everybody agrees. But when it comes to the freedom that God has given to us in submitting to his authority and a, a seed of doubt that can be sown, we give in sometimes in that we just say, could there be that God is not all good as I'm thinking? And the moment we give in to that doubt, that's when sin is lurking at our door. And I uh, don't want to go further, but that's clearly how we can see from the scripture of how sin entered, uh, mankind at least, humanity. Now, quickly, I'll close with one last slide, uh, uh, and that is to touch, we, we saw the origin of sin, but I want to touch uh, another aspect of sin, which is the heinousness of sin, which is vital for us to take note so that we understand how deep our sin is, and how great his salvation is. So, how heinous is sin? The truth is, extending from that reality of that understanding of the origin of sin, we find that man receives all good things from God, and when there is a, a seed of doubt being sown about the goodness of God, he is quickly ready to give in. Just think about First John, First James chapter one verse seventeen. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We need this from the Scripture, and we enjoy good gifts from God, and the greatest and the perfect gift from God. And we read and read that there is no way He can turn 
but uh, but be good always there is no variableness today is good tomorrow is not that's not possible there is no shadow of turning and yet we give in to this doubt because there is something pleasurable to be our own bosses i mean when we doubt god's goodness we can do what we want we don't have to be good like god and so matthew 5 verse 45 talks about for he make it his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the and just he is good to even those that are not good his goodness is not just unquestionable because of the freedom that and if god were not to make man to have that choice we would be like robots right obviously there is no true love out of a choice or out of a heart that can choose to love or not love and that's why we see that god had made the world the way he made and given that opportunity for us to choose to obey and or disobey and choose to love him understanding his goodness and so in, in closing we see uh, the heinousness of sin also gives to us that we despise the richness of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering when god comes back to us again and again and again in spite of our unjustness he is good we despise it and uh, that is how heinous our sin is quickly in closing the heinousness of sin is perfectly answered in the goodness of the cross when anyone questions goodness of god the answer to that man god has given in the cross of calvary that uh, god who is holy and just dealt with our sin on the cross isaiah 53 verse 5 to such an extent that his holiness and his justice would demand a crushing of his beloved son for your and for my forgiveness and so he was crushed and he was brought to rejection for our acceptance and so when we when we come to the cross of calvary we not only have our heinousness of sin be dealt with but his goodness and that's why we read in romans chapter 2 verse 4 or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering not knoweth that the goodness of god leadeth thee to repentance it is again the same goodness that you and i have doubted that is put at full display that your and my heart would melt that my sin and your sin did what it did to that loving savior who crushed who was crushed and marred beyond recognition as a man of sorrows taking our sin and god places such values on broken things when you and i understand such depth of love that he is pursuing after worthless things like you and me after those who were clenched fists broken in sin and not only that he is willing to repair to the level that he has made it for in that in romans 5:21 we read where sin abounded grace did abound much more to such heights he is wanting to take us back that you and i would never ever doubt his goodness again and uh, may that be that we would be amazed at the goodness of god and not give room and again be aware of the heinousness of sin and love the righteousness of god to such a level let's ask the lord for his blessing and loving heavenly father we thank you we praise you for enabling us to come together to come and consider our sin that took you to the cross of calvary our sin that you are poor but yet you are willing our sin that separated the son of god from the father who loved him and gave himself for us lord uh, that we who were rebels to you we who questioned your goodness would be brought to our knees to not only see your forbearance and long suffering but to give our hearts to you and love you from a heart that is 
once again recreated in holiness, all because of this great salvation. Father, we thank you, we praise you for pursuing us while we were dead in our sins and trespasses, for pursuing us while we were blind to, in the satanic blindness, for pursuing us while we were willfully ignorant to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Who are we, Lord, that you love us so much? We ask that you would bless thy word and, mel and help us, Lord, to be in awe of this great salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Thanking and praising you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of the Father, communion of Holy Spirit rest and abide with us both now and forevermore.